Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. Father, this is my plan today. If this agrees with you, then bless it and make it work. But I just want you to know that you're free to interrupt me if you want to, because I want to be available for you. Start saying this every morning, God, what can I do for you today? Instead of giving God your list of 20 things that he's got to do for you to keep you happy and saved that day, how about adding to your prayer list, God, what can I do for you today? It's a scary thought because we think he might tell us something. Here's a good one to pray. What do I have in my possession that you'd like me to give away? Uh-oh. Uh-huh. Let's just don't be bucket plunkers. What is a bucket plunker? Well, that's the person who, you know, throws a little something in the bucket when the plate passes them by on Sunday morning and many times something that's not even really meaningful to them. And then they think because they've done that, that's a big deal. I think that our whole life needs to be open to God. You don't have to worry. God's not ever going to leave you without anything. The more you bless other people, the more you'll have. Blessings will chase you down and overtake you. I love this story of the Good, Good Samaritan. I said last night that we, there's a book called uh, In His Steps. And that's been a pretty popular book for a lot of years. And it's like... Uh, Learning how to walk as Jesus walked. But you know what? I think, I think we should have a book that studies the stops of Jesus, not just the steps of Jesus, because I'll tell you, he was interruptible. We're going to look at several places where he was interrupted. It's pretty amazing how many times Jesus got interrupted in one day. Matthew 8, 1 through 3. When Jesus came down from the mountains, great throngs followed him. And behold, a leper came to him and prostrating himself, worshiped him and saying, Lord, if you're willing, you're able to cleanse me. And he reached out his hand and touched him and said, I am willing, be thou clean. Interruption number one. Verse five, as Jesus went into Capernaum, a centurion came up to him and said, Lord, my servant boy is lying at home paralyzed and distressed with intense pain. And Jesus said, I'll come and restore him. But the centurion replied to him, Lord, I'm not worthy or fit to have you come under my roof, but only speak the word and my servant boy will be cured. This is one of the scriptures that I lean on and I have a prayer before God that I've had before him for years, that when I preach the gospel, people will be healed physically. I believe there's an anointing in the word of God that brings healing to our lives. Jesus didn't even have to go and lay hands on him. The guy said, speak the word only, and my servant boy will be healed. Verse 14 through 16. And when Jesus went into Peter's house, he saw his mother-in-law lying there ill with a fever, and he touched her, and the fever left her, and he got up, and she got up, began to wait on them. And then when evening came, they brought to him many who were under the power of demons, and he drove out the spirits with a word and restored all to health who were sick. And then in verse 16, it says, now it was evening. So we're getting toward the end of the day. They get in a boat to cross over to the other side. And in verse 24, suddenly behold, there arose a violent storm on the sea so that the boat was being covered up by the waves and Jesus was having a little nap. I guess after a day like that, I'd want a nap too. How about you? And the disciples went and woke him up, saying, Lord, rescue us. We're drowning. O ye of little faith. And it just goes on and on. It goes all the way through chapter 9. One thing after another, after another, after another. He'd take a few steps and get interrupted. He'd take a few steps and get interrupted. He would take a few steps and get interrupted. Now, I don't imagine it's going to be to that degree in any of our lives, but the point is made that Jesus was interruptible. And he stopped for hurting people. He stopped for hurting people. He listened to hurting people. Amen? The greatest thing in the world is love. One new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. Now, to love people takes a sacrifice. 
Romans 8, 17 and 18 says, if we want to share his glory, we have to be willing to share his suffering. Now, don't worry, I'm not going to talk about suffering too long because I know that's not a very pleasant subject. But suffering almost always comes before reward. You might say now that I'm living in the glory days of my ministry. Who would not want to do what I'm doing? But let me tell you something, it took a long time to get here. And there was a lot of pain and a lot of tears and a lot of rejection and a lot of people who came against me. I'm not preaching on that tonight, so I won't begin to tell you. But I'll tell you, there is suffering before there's glory. You say, well, I thought Jesus bore all my suffering. Yes, he did bear a lot of our suffering, but there's certain things that we still have to go through, and they help us, they mature us. So let me just give you some examples of some suffering that you might experience so nobody takes it out of context. Forgiving someone is a painful thing to do. When somebody has hurt you really, really, really bad, to be good to them after they've hurt you, to even talk to them after they've hurt you, to even be in their airspace after they have hurt you <laughs> is painful. How many of you agree with that? All right. Being patient with an annoying person <laughs> makes me suffer. <laughs> because to keep my mouth shut is suffering <laughs> for me. Continuing to give to someone who never does anything for me. That's suffering. Taking care of elderly parents who mistreated you in your childhood. That's not easy to do, but God expects us to do it. He does? Yes, he does. Go read your Bible. <laughs> Doing a favor for someone that's going to cause you to sacrifice something that you want to do is a type of suffering. Now, these are all not horrible things, but they are things that we have to go through if we want to be like Jesus. The main reason why we don't really walk in this love that we like to talk about and preach about is because it always costs us something. It's always an effort. There's some energy, some money, some time, a little bit of suffering, a little bit of self-will that has to go by the wayside in order for us to walk in love. And if you don't understand that tonight, then it's going to be a great message. You're going to love the seminar. You're going to clap and cheer. You may even buy the bracelet, but you will not go home and do it. That's why I need four sessions to keep at it over and over and over because I'm concerned if I don't just keep pounding it that you'll go home and forget it. And that's not going to be what we want to happen. We want you to go home and live this out in your schools, in your neighborhoods, at your jobs. Those are where the people are that need help. Here's an example I like to use. What would happen if a certain employee had really mistreated you gossiped about you, made fun of you because you were a believer, then got the promotion that you deserved, has never even so much as given you a kind word, and now you happen to hear that their car is broken down, and it's so bad that it's going to take a lot of money to fix it, and they don't have the money to fix it, and you kind of feel like God is kind of rumbling around in there saying, why don't you offer to pick them up and take them home from work every day till they get this situation fixed? <laughs> <laughs> you know how I respond to that or how I used to? I don't anymore. That cannot be God. <laughs> that is not God. I mean, sometimes we're trying to rebuke the devil and it's God trying to do something in our life. Where did we get the idea that God is never going to ask us to do anything hard or anything that's going to cost us? So what's going to happen with that employee who's lost and going to hell, by the way? <laughs> and they've been making fun of you because you are the company Christian. What's going to happen when you go to them and say, I heard you were having car trouble and I just want you to know that I would be happy to pick you up every morning and take you home every night. Well, are, are you sure? 
Oh, yeah, it's no problem. Well, where do you live? Well, over here. Well, you know, I live way over here. Well, that's no problem. I don't mind going out of my way for you. I, I, I'll be happy to help you. Now, now, now you've just had a witness. Now you have added some fruit to your Jesus pen and your tape recorder and your bumper sticker. Amen? And that's what we don't need. We don't just need a bunch of religion. We need real stuff that we take out of the church with us into the world. You should, let, me let me tell you what Jesus said about religious people. <laughs> and you know, just so you understand what I'm talking about. Jesus didn't die so we could have a religion. I don't care if it's Catholic or Baptist or Methodist or Presbyterian or Pentecostal or Charismatic or whatever it is. Which even all that really is silly. I mean, you know, we don't need to be divided up in a bunch of groups with all of our own little special names on it. I mean, we're the body of Christ. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. Well, you know, Sister Joyce, I heard you're one of those charismatic folks, and there's a possibility you speak in tongues, and I just don't agree with that. Well, then fine, just don't do it. <laughs> we can love each other anyway. Well, who's right? I want to know which one of these religions is right. None of them are 100% right. Not mine, not yours, not anybody else's. We're doing the best we can to understand the best that we can, and as long as we've got the important stuff right... Amen? Amen? People argue over stuff that don't even make any sense, and you don't even want me to get off on that. Jesus didn't die so we could all have a religion. He died so we could have a personal relationship with him through Christ. And so he could teach us how to love. So religious people are people who go through the motions, but it's just all outward stuff. So in Matthew 23, this is what Jesus said about religious people. Religious people tell other people what to do, but they don't do it themselves. They place heavy burdens on other people and won't lift a finger to help them. They do all their works to be seen and admired, and they don't do them out of love. They love places of honor, the best seats in church, titles, and positions. Verse 11, however, in Matthew 23 says, he who is greatest among you must be your servant. Jesus goes on in Matthew 23 to say they are pretenders. They mistreat widows and pray long prayers while they're doing it. Their terrible example leads others into the same behavior. They tithe on every tiny little thing that they have. He says every leaf and mint. But they neglect to do right. They neglect mercy and they neglect justice. They look good on the outside, Jesus said, but on the inside, they're filled with grasping self-indulgence. I would have made a chief Pharisee back in my religious days. Oh my gosh, I was so stinking religious and I had an attitude about everybody. I would go to church on Sunday and then me and my other Christian friends would go and have breakfast and sit there and gossip about the pastor. Ooh, I suppose you've never done that. Well, did, Mabel, did you see that he's got a new car? Well, I tell you what, I'm just, I just think that's just not right. <laughs> don't be jealous of what anybody's got if you don't want to do what they did to get it. Amen. Amen. And then Jesus, I keep saying Jesus said, because this isn't my opinion, this is what he said. They look good on the outside, but inside they're filled with grasping self-indulgence. They focus on gnats and swallow camels. <laughs> they're whitewashed tombs full of dead men's bones. <laughs> Outwardly, they seem to be just and upright, but inwardly, they're filled with pretense. Now, I refuse to be a phony Christian. And the only way that I know to actively, aggressively come against this is to make sure that I'm walking in love and displaying the fruit of the Spirit. 
I believe that we are known by our fruit. Not just by our church attendance, but we are known by our fruit. And when people know that you claim to be a Christian, they are going to watch you to see if you've got the goods. Amen? Yeah, you're still not sure how happy you are about this, but that's okay. <laughs> I know what I'm getting into every time I teach this message, so. Amen. Okay, let me give you an example. <laughs> the first time I taught on love, I was teaching a long eight-part series on love. I was going to take 1 Corinthians 13 apart, teach one on patience, one on goodness, one on kindness. I was now the new love guru, and I was going <laughs> to teach on love. So I'm in the middle of my eight-part series on love. Dave lets me off one day at the McDonald's restaurant. We'd come back from traveling. I was going to go in get us a booth. There were only booths on the perimeter of McDonald's, so there was only about six or seven of them, and we like to sit in the booth, you know, because they're more cushy on your tushy, and <laughs> so we wanted to sit there, and we'd just come back from traveling, and I love for the sun, you know, because when I'm tired, I like the sun, and we would go to the post office, pick up our five or six pieces of mail, however much we had back then, you know, wanting to get some kind of encouragement that, you know, what we were doing made any sense at all, and so there was a crowd going into McDonald's. He said, you run on in there and get us a seat. So I started in and I saw one booth over here and out of the corner of my eye, I saw another guy headed for that same booth. <laughs> and so I had a split second, I mean just a split second to follow the Holy Spirit who was telling me, let him have it. <laughs> Love prefers others, but I wanted it. <laughs> and sad to say, I was preaching on love, but not walking in it yet. So I put it in high gear and walked in. <laughs> Got the booth, sat down. The guy came over to the lady that was sitting at this very booth right in front of me. He knew her and he said to her, there's no places left to sit. Can I sit with you? And she said, yeah, she beat you, didn't she? Oh my gosh. Okay, now here's the really bad part. And some of you have seen me tell this on TV, but the really bad part was the man was crippled. <laughs> he was walking with a cane. So I was preaching my eight part series on love racing a crippled man in McDonald's. Okay, now come on, now do you know what I'm talking about? I can't get you guys to listen to anything if I don't tell stories on myself. Now the Bible says that love prefers other people. <laughs> I wasn't preferring him, I was racing the poor crippled guy. And the thing that was amazing was the woman knew it. She saw me doing it. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Let me tell you, I've done some stuff that I'm not real proud of and it's, it, it, a lot of it's just little stuff like that. But see, here, here's the thing that is so important to me. Yes, I want you to go to church and I want you to behave in church, but more than anything, I want people to get out in the world and show the world Jesus. By being kind and being patient and being loving and doing things for people and especially doing things for people that don't deserve it and won't understand it. They just won't get it. And if you keep it up long enough, they'll begin to believe that maybe you do have something after all that's real and genuine and that they need. That's the price we pay. That's the price we pay. That's why when the mother of Zebedee's son said, I want my two sons to sit, one on your right hand and one on your left when you come into your kingdom, he said, you don't know what you're asking. Are you willing to drink the cup that I drink? Are you willing to be baptized with the baptism with which I'm baptized? I believe that God wants to baptize people in love. 
I, want, I think that he wants us to be walking, talking, breathing love. And that has nothing to do with being selfish and self-centered. Amen? Amen? Now, examples of positive record keeping. Dave is always willing to quickly forgive me when I have done something wrong toward him. Dave is very patient when I'm late. Dave picks up after himself, does the dishes at night, tells me to rest. He tells me every day that he loves me, he hugs me and compliments me on my clothes or the way that I look. I never preach a message that he doesn't tell me that was a great message. He is very stable emotionally. He is never, almost never grouchy. Takes good care of himself physically. Dave still looks just like he did when we got married, except back then he worked out even harder and had a lot more muscle, but he's... <laughs> he's very protective of me. I always feel safe when I'm with Dave. He'll buy me anything I want that we can afford. In every situation in life, there's good things that people do and there's things that you don't like. And one of the ways that we can display love is by keeping a record of the good things and not keeping a record of the bad things. Love takes no account of the evil done to it. You know, we need to value other people. We need to be committed. Love is committed for the long haul. It's not just in it for a few short minutes. And then lastly, I want to say this tonight because I think it is an important part of love. And some of you will be very happy that I'm saying this. There's also a tough side to love. There's also a time when we have to confront people. There's also a time when we have to tell them, I don't appreciate the way you're treating me and I'm not going to put up with it. There's a time when we say to people, no, I'm not going to do that for you anymore because I'm just enabling you to keep your problem. There's always another side to it. And I love what the Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians 7, 8 through 10, if we can just close with these. He actually wrote the church there a letter that was quite painful to them. 2 Corinthians 7, 8 through 10. For even though I did grieve you with my letter, I don't regret it now, though I did regret it, for I see that that letter did pain you, though only for a little while. Yes, I'm glad now, not because you were in pain, but because you were pained into repentance. And so you were turned back to God. For you felt a grief such as God meant you to feel, so that in nothing you might soft, suffer loss through us, our harm for what we did. Verse 10, for godly grief and the pain that God is permitted to direct produces a repentance that leads and contributes to salvation and deliverance from evil, and it never brings regret. I think that's so important to realize that sometimes the best thing you can say to somebody is, no, I won't do that for you because that's your responsibility, and you need to be taking that responsibility and doing it. No, I won't continue to enable you to have the problem that you have. And even in not letting people mistreat you, sometimes you need to just say, I'm not going to just keep enabling you to treat me that way. So you always have to be led by the Spirit in these things. There's a time to just put up with it and put up with it and put up with it. But when it comes to abuse or what somebody is doing to you, they're actually hurting themselves by you continuing to let them do it then for their, for their sake, that's when you need to put your foot down and say, no more. Amen. Amen? All right, come on, give God a big praise. Do you have a do not disturb sign hanging across your life? You know, if we really want to walk in love, then we have to be willing to be interrupted, to lay aside our plan and follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit. I've often discovered that people don't always need help on my timetable or my schedule. So sometimes we need to be willing to stop what we're doing to help someone else. You know, I believe that your joy will increase when you take time to stop and love other people.
I want you to meet my buddy, Angela. She is seven years old. She's very, very ticklish. We've been able to make an impact in Angela and her family's life after a very devastating loss. You see, we're here in Zambia and water is a huge need here. Even though we are right along the banks of the Zambezi River where you think water would be plentiful, but that water is extremely dangerous. And Angela lost one of her sisters to a crocodile along the river as they were gathering water. If you can even imagine such a loss as a parent, as a sister, to lose someone that you love in such a terrible way. This is the biggest river in Zambia. So there were a lot of problems. There are a lot of crocodiles in the river. There are a lot of hippos in the river. The most affected are people, their children. Uh, I lost my daughter, cut by the crocodile. I sent her to go and fetch water. How old was she? 10 years. 10 years old? Yes. Every time we, uh, we fetch water from that side, we, we drink it direct without uh, putting any chemical in it. As you can see, this is, these are just villages. They don't have uh, money to buy chlorine or any chemical to purify water. So uh, we had uh, uh, diseases like uh, dysentery, diarrhea, uh, waterborne diseases. We were crying for clean water. How many people would you say were, were sick from waterborne illness during that time? There were many. If you, even if you go to the clinic there, they will give you the number. The people were suffering from this diarrhea and so forth. Now we are happy. We are drinking clean water. We are living a better life now. Now we are getting good water, safe water. Yes, even crocodiles are no more accident for crocodiles. We thank you very much for what you are doing. And people are healthier? Yes, very much. This ball which is set here, it's not from, uh, from you. It's not from Hand of Opal itself, but it's from God himself. So they thank, they thank God for bringing hand of hope, to bring all that support all the way to here. It is safe, madam. We are happy on that. And all the people now are very happy. Praise to God. God loves us. Thank you. So now as Edith and her three girls are gathering water, they don't have to be in fear. They don't have to be in fear of the dangers of the river, of the animals, of the disease that the water carries. And we are so grateful that you have been right here with us to provide this for them. It's through your love for Christ and it's in sharing that love with Edith, her girls, and the entire village in this area that you are changing the world one little bit at a time. Wilt u meehelpen de wereld te veranderen? Word dan onze partner en doneer regelmatig. Wij sturen u graag kostenloos onze brochure toe. Vraag deze aan door te bellen naar 026 20 22 100 of ga naar joyce-meyer.nl slash partner.